to the uh, Department of Energy's SBIR, STTR, Fiscal Year 14, Phase 1, Release 1 Topics webinar. My name is Chris O'Gwen, and I will be moderating uh, today's meeting. In just a moment, you'll hear directly from Manny Oliver, the director of uh, the DOE's SBIR, STTR Programs Office. He will provide you with some basic topics information as it relates to this Release 1. Uh, following uh, Manny Oliver's uh, introduction, uh, you'll then hear directly from the subtopic managers, many of these subtopic managers uh, for topics 1 through 15, uh, as they clarify their expectations and answer your questions regarding their specific subtopics. Uh, and many of the questions received uh, during the registration will be addressed as well. Uh, I will tell you up front, uh, we've had uh, with topics uh, 7 and 9, we will not be presenting those. So if you do have questions on topics 7 and 9, uh, please uh, email directly to those uh, topic managers as they will be identified on the slides uh, as we go through that. Or you can find uh, the topics document on the DOE SBIR STTR website. Uh, and you will find that uh, uh, the uh, address for that, the web link, uh, throughout the uh, webinar. And, uh, a couple other things. Yes, you will receive uh, a web link to this recorded webinar following the webinar. So if you're hearing me right now, that means you're registered. And all registered participants will receive that link uh, directly from us uh, following this webinar. It will also be available on our website as well. Uh, and I believe that's about it for the, uh, the housekeeping. So let me go ahead and turn this on over to, to Manny Oliver as he he gives you a brief introduction here to where we are. Thank you very much. Uh, again, just the, the brief agenda, as Chris mentioned, I'll just give a five-minute introduction. And again, today we're just introducing the topics. Uh, many of you might have questions about the number of awards and uh, issues that would, uh, questions we can address better when we put out the funding opportunity announcement, which will be uh, occur in August. But today we're just really focused on the topics and your technical questions related to the uh, topic areas. Um, and again, we have two programs uh, represented today in topics 1 through uh, 15, uh, the Office of Advanced Scientific Computing Research and the Office of Basic Energy Sciences. And we do have webinars on uh, Tuesday and Wednesday for the remaining topics. Uh, next. Um, so for uh, fiscal 2014, there are two phase one announcements. Uh, we refer to them as releases. So release one. Uh, and here is the list of the programs participating in Release 1 uh, and Release 2. And, and Release 2 will come out uh, later in the, uh, in the year, uh, about uh, three months from now. So uh, with Release 1, uh, indicate these are going to be five of the uh, programs from the Office of Science, uh, as well as the Office of Defense Nuclear Nonproliferation. Uh, in Release 2, we will have many of the applied programs one of the changes we made this year is that the Office of uh, Fusion Energy Sciences, which last year participated in Release 1, uh, has moved over to Release 2 this year. Uh, so please be aware of that for some of the folks who are expecting to see uh, fusion energy topics in this release. Uh, there will not be any, uh, but they will be in Release 2. Next slide. Uh, and again, here's our Phase 1 schedule uh, for the year. Uh, and for both Release 1 and Release 2, uh, there's not much that's changed. It, you know, it's very similar to the schedule for last year. Just want to, for those of you new to the program, we do release the topics about a month before the uh, funding opportunity announcement. Uh, we do have a letter of intent requirement, uh, and that's a mandatory letter of intent. Uh, so please be aware of that. Um, and again, there we're just looking for an abstract uh, from your uh, uh, for your full application uh, for this uh, release one. The uh, applications will be due October 15th. Uh, and you can expect to hear, hear from us in early January as to whether uh, you were recommended for award. And your grant would start uh, in February. Next. Uh, when we, actually, when we issue the uh, funding opportunity announcement, uh, we will hold a webinar uh, later that week. The, uh, the, uh, the FOA will come out on Monday, and on Friday we'll have a, a webinar. And that's your opportunity to ask questions about, uh, you know, how do I apply? Um, and uh, questions more in the mechanics of the application. As I mentioned, today we'll be mostly focused on questions about our topic areas. Uh, and there will be plenty of opportunity for Q&A there as well. Uh, so in getting into the topics, uh, the questions we get around the topics, where do we get our topics? So the topics are created by DOE program managers. Uh, they are often funding 
uh, R&D, not only at small businesses through the SBIR program, but through universities and national labs. Uh, they're very uh, up to speed on the, on, the, on the activities in these areas. Uh, many of them cover a fairly broad area, so they do rely on other experts, uh, sometimes in the national labs uh, and in industry and universities to uh, formulate where the breakthroughs needed uh, to move uh, some of these technologies forward. Um, the other thing is when we put out our topics, we do organize them by the program office. Uh, if you're new to DOE, probably over time you'll learn which program offices fund which types of research that might be uh, of interest to you. Uh, what we do uh, in our topics is list the DOE program managers associated with each topic and subtopic. Uh, you are allowed to ask them questions uh, at webinars like today, but you can certainly email them uh, between now and the time you submit your application. We do want to point out that their role is really to clarify what they're you know, looking for, what the topic is about. Uh, it's really up to you to decide to apply. So you really shouldn't be asking them, should I apply or not? That's really your decision uh, based on finding whether the technology and the expertise you have uh, is a good fit to the, uh, uh, the problems they've identified in their topic. Next. Uh, sorry, this is a little compressed on the right, but this is an example of the topic. Um, so each of our topics you know, is numbered, and each of our subtopics has a letter. Uh, those are very important, so you need to specify the topic and subtopic when you submit your letter of intent in your application. Uh, if you submit a, uh, an application, for example, without a topic and subtopic, uh, we won't try to assign it for you. You will just be administratively declined, so do pay attention to that. Uh, we have added a new header this year. Uh, it's a little box in blue up above, and that indicates the amount of the Phase One award uh, and the Phase Two award when you submit for Phase Two. Uh, and also indicates whether we're accepting uh, both SBIR and STTR applications as well as uh, fast track applications. Uh, so do read through that header uh, for each of the topics you're thinking of applying to. to. Uh, as I mentioned before, we do list the program manager. Uh, they may vary by subtopic, so do make sure when you're asking questions uh, 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 that you pay attention to the fact that there may be multiple uh, uh, managers associated with a single topic. Uh, we do have another subtopic. Sometimes we get questions about that. Uh, again, the purpose of that is to uh, allow you to submit things that uh, clearly fall within the topic. So again, at the top of this beginning of topic seven here, there's a, a broad description. It must fall within that broad description, but it might fall outside of the specific subtopics A and B here. Uh, and in the past few years, about uh, I think six to nine percent of our awards have gone through the other uh, subtopic. And again, uh, many but not all of our topics uh, provide references. So these are uh, provided by the program managers to bring you, help you bring you up to speed about what's going on in these fields. So we encourage you to take advantage of those. Next. Uh, one of the things we introduced last year were technology transfer opportunities. Um, and we're going to continue that this year. Uh, these are really an opportunity for you to take advantage of uh, intellectual property that was developed either at a DOE lab or university. Uh, and the intent here is different from our regular topics. In our regular topic, you are uh, the, the program managers have identified a breakthrough that's required, and you're, you're going to come up with an idea to address it. Uh, here we've uh, identifying, again, the uh, intellectual property, something that's usually been patented or has a patent application, uh, and we're looking for you to take that uh, invention uh, and uh, drive it towards commercialization. Uh, so not only do you get an SBR or an STTR grant, you'd also get an option to license the technology. Uh, there's more details of this in pages one to two of the topic document, so we encourage you to look at the, the very beginning of the topic document uh, if you're planning to apply to a tech transfer opportunity. Uh, and again, this, these uh, tech transfer opportunities will look a little different uh, in the sense that you'll see uh, much more information uh, related to a national lab uh, or a university. Uh, so we will uh, provide you with contact information to a tech transfer office at a national lab um, and any questions you have about the status, uh, you know, of patents, uh, the, the state of the technology that was developed in the lab, how far they went, are there any research reports, uh, you should direct those to the National Lab. If you have any questions about uh, what is uh, the DOE program interested in seeing you do with the, uh, uh, the tech transfer opportunity, uh, you can direct those uh, to the DOE program manager that's also listed there. Uh, next. We have our last slide. Uh, and this just relates to fast track applications. Again, uh, this is something we introduced last year. It's a combined phase one, phase two application. Uh, and the purpose of this is to eliminate the gap 
uh, when your phase one ends, you apply for phase two and you secure the phase two funding, there's typically about a five month gap at DOE. Uh, and uh, submitting a fast track application would allow you to uh, you know, avoid that gap. Uh, I would caution you that it's certainly much more challenging to submit the combined application. Uh, you do have to submit the full commercialization plan that's required for a phase two application. So it may not be suitable for you know majority of our applicants, particularly people doing very high risk work in phase one where the phase two work is not really well defined or, or hard to define at this time. Uh, for last year, only about 4% of our applications were received in fast track and we expect it to be, you know, to stay below about 10% that this will be a minority of the uh, applications received. I would point out that our fast track award rate last year was similar to that for our phase one uh, award rate. Uh, I think that's our last slide. Uh, just point out, uh, you know, again, I think uh, these slides uh, and a, record a recording of this webinar will be made available uh, in case you missed or want to go back to any of the slides here, such as the contact information uh, for our office. Uh, I think from here we'll, uh, you know, we'll go through and again uh, cover the topics and uh, take your questions and address some of the questions that were submitted today, uh, submitted prior to the, uh, the webinar. So I'll turn it back to Chris. Yes, and, and let me just point out that uh, you may text your questions uh, via the chat text box as they relate uh, to each of these topics during the topic discussion and we will present those as appropriate to the topic manager as he or she finishes up uh, uh, all of the subtopics underneath that one subtopic. Uh, the, uh, let you please keep in mind that this is a topics webinar, so if you're submitting questions in regards to the funding opportunity announcement or eligibility as a small business or, or something about the PI, please direct those just to our office at any time. And more specifically, uh, we will, as Manny mentioned earlier, we'll be putting out a funding opportunity announcement uh, uh, next month, and we will also be having shortly thereafter a funding opportunities announcement webinar and we'll be able to answer your questions more appropriately at that time. So if you have a question in regards to the topic, uh, specifically at subtopics, you may submit those during the manager's presentation, and then we will present those as appropriate uh, following his or her discussion. So let's go ahead and kick off with uh, topic one from our Advanced Scientific and Computing Research Program. And topic one uh, will be covered by uh, Rich Carlson. Rich? Thank you, Chris. Um, the OSCAR Advanced Scientific Computing Research Program Office uh, has two main uh, components. One is a facilities division, which has three large supercomputers and an IP network to cover the U.S. backbone to supply networking activity to the science communities that use our facilities uh, and allow access to other facilities, both nationally and internationally. Uh, we also have a research program that deals with applied math, uh, computer science, uh, specifically trying to build a next generation supercomputer, uh, the networking program, and a computational science program to link the computer science research with the domain science communities. Uh, our SBIR program focuses on two major topics. Uh, one is the advanced networking technologies and services. Uh, there are three uh, subtopics in here. One is management tools. We know that IP networks are used throughout the globe for people doing science and for other communications. And we find that those networks are relatively hard to manage. There are a lot of tools that were either homegrown uh, or people use things that were uh, created by some open source community and there's usually little support or ad hoc support, and we'd like to see that improve, so we're looking for people to send us uh, proposals to deal with how do we manage these kinds of networks, either in a, a regional network, a, a campus network, a DOE network, a, a state network. Uh, we don't really care where those networks are used because it's all the same network technologies, but we'd like to see them used and better managed so it's easier for people to understand what's going on in the networks, both the user community and the operator community. Uh, the next topic is optical networking. Uh, optical networks have revolutionized the way we do things in the wide area. They're moving down into the commercial world in uh, regional and to the home. 
Uh, we also see optical networking moving down inside the computer, replacing copper wires with fiber optic communications. And so we're looking for component services, uh, tools that allow you to build or manage these kinds of networks and, and these kind of components for networks um, that allow us to do a better job. Uh, the third topic is uh, middleware and networking with de is data aware. Uh, DOE and its science communities generate a large amount of data. Uh, moving that data, storing that data, dealing with the workflow management systems, being able to do uh, science with that data is a very important element. And we have a lot of work that's been done in the past in that area. And what we're looking for is people to either harden the technologies and, and tools that we have already developed or to come up with a compatible version or a comparable version that allows people to deal with science communities and other user communities to deal with this large amount of data that is uh, floating around or being generated uh, on service servers and systems today. Uh, there is a technology transfer opportunity uh, dealing with cybersecurity, and that's run out of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and the contact information is there. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the second topic is high-performance computing. Uh, we're trying to push high-performance computing out of the realm of pure science and into the realm of advanced manufacturing and engineering. Uh, we think that high-performance computing can have a huge impact on the ability of a small company to uh, develop a new product, to prototype a product in software rather than bending a piece of metal first, uh, or to um, change the way they do business. Uh, and so we're looking at services and solutions that do this, and there's three major elements. One is a complete turnkey solution that, that you can put forward and someone could stand up and uh, run your application, your, your code, with the ability for them to do a job. So the idea is that they don't have to become an expert in using your code. They become an expert in the manufacturing and engineering ta tasks that they're interested in doing. Uh, we know there's a lot of tools that have been built in the past uh, and other ser services that are required. We see the cloud computing environment moving forward. Uh, and so we would like to see tools that make it easy for uh, engineering and manufacturing communities to start using compute resources either that they own or that they purchase uh, on a as-needed basis. And then lastly, there's a lot of code that has been developed for science use that could be beneficial for industry as well. So we'd like to see that code hardened. Uh, we know that our research piece of code uh, may be usable by the developer, but that doesn't mean that the user community, manufacturing community can use it. So we'd like to either see our codes hardened or if you have a, a comparable version of code that does the same thing, then you could push forward that and say we'd like to make this much easier to use by the science communities or, excuse me, by the manufacturing and engineering communities that we want to see uh, benefit from this code. Uh, those are the two major programs inside OSCAR, and I'll entertain any questions that might come up. It, it looks, Rich, it looks like we have one question that came up. Uh, it says, regarding optical network support services, would that include higher risk work such as the development of on-chip optical sources for optical interconnects? Uh, yes, that is something that we have looked at in the past and will continue to look at. Okay, well, very good, Rich. I think that's all we have for now. Why don't we go ahead and move on to the uh, to topic number three, and that would be covered by uh, Elian. Elian, okay. the the floor is yours. So, the scientific user facilities uh, promotes research and development towards the present, the current, and future facilities that include. Uh, Neutron sources, X-ray sources, and uh, FEL, laser, FEL lasers facilities. For this year, we have chosen two main topics, which are detector technology, R&D, and uh, X-ray optics, R&D. Within 
these two, we we uh, ask the experts what are the main areas that should be addressed. We are looking for above state of the art instrumentation that allows the u for detectors the enormous use of uh, data that is coming from the experiments. We have uh, we want a higher accuracy, spatial uh, definition, energy definition, and for X-ray optics. We realize that there has been uh, a need for attention to the area, and we have uh, asked for also breakthroughs from the state of the art. Within the uh, detectors, we have subtopics like high quantum efficiency area, vacuum, infrared, and so on. And uh, we have also three topics within uh, X ray optics. Um, many, many references are given. I call attention for the detectors for the results of a rec recent workshop that was done, uh, sponsored by BES, and uh, you can access it through the SSC, the Sci Office of Science website. It contains the main research priorities direction, and these topics are much, very much based on the recommendations by the experts in the workshop. And the same thing for X-ray optics, we base the, the selection of topics on the recent workshop by, and the recommendations by those experts. All right, did you get any questions in advance for this? I did some questions. Yes, I did get some questions in advance. Uh, I have to, to say that many of them do not refer to my uh, topics. Questions are asking about energy efficiency, uh, funding available for phase one SBR, are okay. types of questions that I am not uh, okay. able to answer. Very specific question. I have one specific question asking about materials for detectors, and I have to say that is part of the research that the proposer has to do. He has to look for the type of detector that he wants to uh, offer uh, a breakthrough and select the type of, mater of material that he feels is the most appropriate for that uh, detector. That was the most specific. Okay. Chris, did you have some there, more? There's one question uh, in regards to your topic 3A. Uh, are you able to elaborate on what detectors currently are in use there? What, what do you mean? And if not, maybe sure. we can have them contact you directly? He can. I can, uh, I can uh, direct him to the workshop uh, report that is specifies things that are being done today and the things that are being uh, seeking, uh, sought for future applications. Um, types of detectors using, used today, they are uh, superconduct some superconducting uh, detectors. There are scintillators. There are uh, PADs. There are several, several, several. Uh, I would recommend looking into the detector workshop report and, and having a complete list of uh, available detectors and uh, future uh, directions for detector development. W would that be one of the? Uh, uh, would that be included in the references underneath this topic, Eliana? Yes, 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 yes. Very good. Well, then we can point them right to the references for topic 3A here. And then if there's no other questions for Topic 3, uh, let's go ahead on and move to uh, Topic 4. And this is still Elian, Optics Devices for Light Source Facilities. Yes. Again, I didn't get, at least on the questions they were forward to me, no one specific towards X-ray optics. Uh, many of the questions are related to energy conservation that are not my aid, under my aid. 
Okay, that's fine. Yeah, we, we did have another question that came in online. Was it related to topics three and four, but I think related to the uh, the air topics you've sponsored in the past and said, can you give some background information about why there are no accelerated accelerator related topics in this year's BES topics? Yes. Um, the topics related to accelerator were available for more than four years. We have had quite a wide variety and very deep response to those topics. We have uh, funded many projects, and the community pointed out that the two topics that needed really serious attention were instrumentation, among them detectors and X-ray optics. And we decided then to fully concentrate on those two. Thank you. Well, very good. Uh, and again, if anyone has any other questions as it relates to topics three and four, they can submit those directly uh, uh, to the email address that you see on your screen right there. And uh, Manny, I don't see any other questions coming in for this topic. Did you, are we ready to move on? There's a question under, under got chat questions. There's one question. Oh, you mean the hand raised? Yeah. Yeah, I think somebody had. It says chat, questions one and answered. Oh, yeah, I think that's the. Uh, uh, yeah, that's just our screen there. Uh, sorting. We pulled up. We pulled up all the questions that we've had. That was a flagged question there. Uh, that you already answered. Oh, this. Uh, so, yeah. Salim Mibushi, I know him very well, and I can understand why he is asking that. All right. So I know that's a rate related stuff this time. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to topic five. Jane. And uh, Jane? Jane's not here. Is she online? She's not here in the. Uh... Okay. So we do not have Jane. Jane Zhu will be calling in or dropping by shortly. Uh, so why don't we just go ahead on off to uh, uh, topic six, I believe Elian or uh, Thiaga is going to cover this. Am I correct? Uh, hi. <coughs> I'm going to move closer. <coughs> yeah, all right. So um, we have a court program on the neutron scattering uh, technologies, you know, for mostly uh, pushing, you know, our court program actually um, has to push the technologies for future needs of the scientific research. So um, the, the needs are very high resolution, both spatial and temporal resolution uh, neutron scattering detectors. This is, these are needed in the sense, you know, for the, for the case of like spallation neutron source, uh, we, we need uh, uh, to do both uh, neutron scattering, diffraction, imaging, all kinds of things. Uh, and, uh, and always there is a need for uh, higher resolution and higher temporal resolution also high efficiency detectors. So um, as you all know, helium-3 is not anymore available, but helium-3 detectors themselves are not, they're, they're efficient, but they don't have the spatial resolution that we, we need. So uh, alternate technologies are needed, and that's why we have been having this program uh, for a longer term, uh, trying to uh, see uh, what uh, uh, small businesses can offer in developing these kind of uh, technologies. The other topic is uh, the need is uh, neutron optics. So neutron optics, you know, we, we are, have guides, we have, uh, you know, lenses, all those things, but uh, uh, neutron scattering uh, always uh, suffers from the very low um, brightness of the source. So in specific cases, some of the experiments cannot be even done. So focusing uh, optics become important, and also you know also other any kind of focusing optics. Uh, that's a novel that can be uh, uh, used for for a wide bandwidth. Uh, the you know neutron sources like spallation neutron source will be uh, will be very uh, uh, useful in the sense it can actually increase the rate and also it can lend uh, you know uh, use doing experiments. So. So that's another topic, and the third topic is you know we need a, a very uh, special uh, um, sample environment. 
Uh, sometimes they can be very complicated and you know exotic in some cases. Uh, so we really would like uh, you to find out what kind of things are done and what could you develop. So these are the three topics, major topics that uh, we would like to cover under you know under this program. Um, and uh, the references are there for you to really go through and find out what's the state of the art. And also, I think it's easy to access uh, you know the websites of the user facilities like SNS. Uh, uh, iFlux Newton, you know, uh, uh, isotope research reactor, and then also at La Salama's uh, spallation neutron source. In addition, of course, uh, there is also a reactor at uh, NIST. So you can, if we're going over to their websites, you can actually get, uh, you know, get a knowledge about what are the things that are that are there. And uh, by talking to the instrument scientists, especially, you can find out what the needs are. So. So th those are you know, those are the topics that will be uh, that will be sort of uh, uh, will be needed you know, uh, from the SBIR uh, route uh, and the new 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 um, research uh, leading to um, uh, you know detector detector and all these technologies. So I got well, very uh, good. Four, uh, four questions. Are, are you uh, Tiaga? Are you able to address uh, what type? Uh, what is the time resolution needed, or what is the spatial resolution needed as it relates to 6A, topic 6A? Yeah, the spatial resolution depends, you know, so I don't want to give one number. There is what, nothing, nothing like one number. Uh, it is very, uh, it's, it varies from technique to technique. Uh, for mm -hmm. instance, from diffraction to move on to uh, inelastic scattering to imaging, it can vary. So, so I think if you are uh, developing something for a, uh, for a certain class of experiments, you cannot just do ev one detector is not going to cover everything, uh, every application. Right. So you've got to really focus, okay, what is your strength? And then what is up there in, you know, in that kind of uh, realm? And then you've got to go after that. So there is no one number that, uh, that I can give you. So it okay. also has to have the, not only the spatial, temporal, and also efficiency, all these three things uh, should go together uh, for, a, for a class of experiments. And what about uh, in regards to the other subtopic? Uh, is there a need for cost-effective uh, electronic readout systems to read out detectors? Um, yeah, because uh, that's a part of it, right? Once you develop something, the detectors uh, have to be, like for instance, if you are doing experiments that uh, are that the, the instruments at this palation neutron source, in addition to X, Y, you know, the position, you also need a time uh, stamped. Uh, so the electronics, faster electronics are needed for that. Mm -hmm. So you really mm -hmm. need, and a detector is actually, uh, in addition to that, you know, there's electronics, uh, integrated electronics. That, of course, uh, has, can be easily uh, adapted uh, in, the, in the facility. So talking to the facilities is uh, extremely important for your success. Very good. Very good. And uh, I, I believe I, that was the last of our questions uh, for, for topic six. Yeah, I had six. some questions submitted in advance, Chris, so I th think it was Okay. And yeah, I think if somebody asked scope and basic requirements, I think it's all there. Uh, you know, it's very, the topics are very specifically defined, so you, you have to look at uh, those uh, descriptions. Um, and uh, what is the desired spatial resolution? I already addressed limitations for the use of uh, government facilities. Boris uh, has had a question. I don't know what it actually means. Boris, are you there? Uh, yeah, again, they're all okay. muted, so. Oh, I see. So, so limitations, uh, I don't know what it means, but uh, my understanding is, can you do your research at, uh, let's say, NIST, for instance? Of course you can. But the thing is, the, uh, the end of the day, you know, we, what we are looking for is uh, these t technologies for our BOE facilities. That's the mission. And then what uh, we are use, using a specialized sample environment for development of new pharmaceuticals uh, and neutron scattering. Okay, so pharmaceuticals is not our mission. Our mission is materials research, you know, new phenomena, the things like that. So, um, so pharmaceuticals is not in our mission. Can small companies apply in collaboration with the national lab? Of course, that's the SBIR question. You know, further questions, you need to talk to, uh, you know, contact SBIR for clarifications. Yes, yeah, so again, that certainly is the case both under SBIR and STTR. Uh, those type of collaborations are certainly encouraged. Is there any other questions? I don't see any questions. So, 
I'm done. Okay. And I believe Jane will be uh, joining us shortly. I'm here. Ah, I'm here. So, so then why don't we go? Daughter, we're not very topic specific earlier. Okay. So you could just okay, so this is topic, topic five. This is in regards to uh, instrumentation for electron microscopy and scanning probe microscopy. Jane, the floor is yours. Yes. Yes. Uh huh. Uh, oh, I didn't bring the. You want me to? Just a brief introduction. What you're looking for. Oh, okay. We're looking for uh, capabilities. I mean, the significant improvement capabilities in electron uh, microscopy. Electron microscopy mainly on transmission electron microscopy. Um, and the uh, energy resolution I and mean, the spectroscopy. The scanning probe, uh, yeah, it, again, it's, it has to be much, uh, <coughs> much more uh, improved than the current capability. And we're addressing materials research area. Does that That's fine. Yeah, yeah. We're just, uh, most of the details are in the topics. We're not really looking for our topic managers to really repeat their details, but again, just to you know, a brief description of what we're looking for. And again, we're fielding questions from anybody who wants to type them into the chat uh, by chat. Uh, again, we're not doing the, for those of you who are trying to raise your hand, we're doing most of the uh, question submission through uh, the chat box. So, uh, Okay, so we did receive a question in. Um, it's rather lengthy. Uh, I'll go ahead and read it out for the, uh, the audience. In the program announcement, uh, it mentioned that about DOE interest in insulated and shielded probes and electrochemical cells for high resolution electrical imaging in conductive, uh, I guess that's materials. I see in the last year there was a company receiving a award for developing probes for conductive AFM under liquid. Uh, are you still interested in such probes? I think we submit a proposal for developing probes for conductive AFM in liquid media. Uh, I think the answer in general is yes, it's a competition. Um, so whoever provides the best uh, capability uh, will be selected. Uh, the next one is, will DOE uh, be interested in an array-type electron source? No. It has to be a point source like we use in the transmission electron microscope. We're not interested in arrays. Okay, I think there are no other questions, so Chris will. Yes, Jane. We're, we're okay, thank you. Thank you, Jane. We'll go ahead and move on uh, to topic eight, as I'd mentioned earlier. Uh, there's topic seven. Uh, Larry Ron will not be joining us, so if you have any questions as it relates to any of these uh, subtopics here in topic seven, go ahead and contact Larry uh, Ron directly via his. Uh, email address there. So I believe we'll go ahead and uh, move on to topic eight, which would be uh, Mike Casasa. Mike, you there? Yeah, hello. This is Michael Casasa. Okay, this topic is about instrument instrumentation for ultra-fast X-ray science. Now, you may have seen in the previous topics the words ultra-fast and the words X-rays, but this is the topic that combines the two. Um, in BES, we're very interested in probing the um, fundamental chemical transformations um, at an atomic or molecular level. Uh, and increasingly, it appears that a good way to do this is with X-rays. Um, typically, X-rays will be, oh, I, I hesitate to offer a wavelength range, but they correspond to uh, transitions amongst uh, electrons in the inner shells of atoms. These are not hard X-rays, necessarily. And those reveal chemical information about their targets. And with ultra-fast pulses that are picosecond or less, maybe in the range of femtoseconds, uh, you have time resolution to, to see um, the particles in a, in a molecule actually adjusting positions. So that's what we're after. That's what we want to be able to do. There are many examples of, uh, I would say, demonstration of a production of short x-rays in the literature. Um, this is really cutting-edge science at this point. Um, all of these have an allusion to their applicability to probing chemical systems, but the actual numbers of applications out there are very few. And we're looking for uh, SBIR projects that will take some of these approaches that we've seen in the laboratory 
and uh, render them you know, more useful, more generally useful uh, for, 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 for investigating chemical systems. So the subpack topic as I've written it is really broad. Um, it, it includes developing directly x-ray sources, but also more indirectly um, developing laser technology that's used as in a step along the way to generate x-rays. For instance, there are people um, producing x-rays starting with uh, near-infrared lasers. It turns out the physics of the high harmonic generation pro project that process that it relies upon uh, may work better with longer wavelength lasers. So we're interested in that development. But that's just one example of x-ray development. There's, there's plenty of others. Um, we're also interested in ideas for how to synchronize these ultra-short pulses with other aspects of an experiment and how to characterize the, those pulses. That's all a challenge. I've given you some historical references in the, um, um, in the subtopic write-up. Uh, those are still pretty good. For, for finding out what's really current, what's really happening now, I would highly recommend that you go look at the abstracts for recent physics conferences, particularly the, uh, the, um, the uh, American Institute of Physics or the American Phys Physical Society's Division of, of Atomic and Molecular and Optical Physics. There you will see most of the practitioners doing fundamental research in this area. I think that's all I need to say for now. Uh, thanks, Michael. And, and Manny, I don't see a, a question for topic eight here at the moment. So unless you see something have, we can I do. I have one, one, top, one question that came in email that was really general. And I didn't know the answer to it. Um, it was about whether there was a set aside for the fast track awards. Okay. All right. Uh, and again, we'll address you know those FOA type questions for, or funding opportunity announced questions in our next webinar. But again, today we'll just focus on the uh, the technical topics. Okay. So we'll move on. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, topics seven and nine will not have any representation today. But if you have a question for topic nine here or seven. Uh, you can refer directly to our topics document, and you can contact these topic managers directly. Uh, the topic 9 here for software infrastructure for web-enabled chemical physics simulations is Mark Peterson. So and I believe we have online here uh, a, uh, for topic, uh, let's see, we have some questions coming in, but they're related to some future topics. So let's go ahead and and continue on to uh, topic 10. That is a te technology transfer, a TTO, technology transfer opportunities topic. And you will see uh, under A and B subtopics the, the uh, contacts for those, the laboratory contacts. Uh, so you can contact them directly. Uh, and as we move on here to our topic 11, wide band gap, Semiconductors for Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. I believe we have Marina on the line. Marina, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. So the floor is yours, Marina. All right. Uh, so wide band gap semiconductors are semiconductor materials with band gaps significantly greater than 1.7 electron volt. Um, and for this reason, they offer the opportunity for dramatic performance and efficiency improvements in a wide variety of applications. Uh, compared to today's silicon-based technologies, uh, they have the advantage that they can withstand greater voltages over time, switch at higher frequencies with lower power losses, and operate at higher ambient temperatures without external cooling. The wideband gap semiconductors uh, for energy efficiency and renewable energy, SBAR topic, is focused um, on solid-state devices employing wideband gap for use in power electronics uh, per the overall topic description. More specifically, this topic addresses the significant improvements in de device reliability that are needed for widespread adoption in critical energy relevant lower power markets. Uh, these applications, which are of interest and meet the needs of the EERE technology offices, include 50 to 150 watt external power supplies for consumer electronics and appliances electric drive vehicles, medium voltage motor controls, and grid power conversion. More information on the wideband gap interest uh, for power electronics uh, within EERE can be found on the EERE Advanced Manufacturing Office website, including a summary report of a workshop that we convened in July 2012. 
for this solicitation, we have two specific subtopics, A and B, uh, which I'll briefly speak about shortly. Um, both are pretty well defined in their descriptions and address fundamental reliability concerns and I the identification of failure and degradation mechanisms for wideband gap power devices. Um, in particular, for both, um, they're targeting silicon carbide MOSFETs. Uh, to address a common question that's been received uh, uh, and elaborate on the definition of other areas in subtopic C, grant applications that fall within the scope of the topic description uh, will include proposals that uh, address other fundamental device reliability, degradation, and failure modes, as well as associated barriers for wideband gap-based power transistors uh, whose solving can assist manufacturers in the commercialization and wider spread adoption of the above-mentioned power electronics applications. So uh, this could include, for example, gallium nitride-based transistors or other uh, device reliability degradation and failure concerns uh, that, are, that are blocking their um, scale-up in manufacturing. Uh, for subtopic A, the purpose is to fundamentally understand the failure mechanism of commercially available silicon carbide power MOSFETs, uh, which are caused by a large density of interface and bulk traps present in thermally grown gate oxide films, uh, as well as other defects present in the epilayers of silicon carbide, such as thre threshold voltage shift under application of gate voltage at elevated temperatures. Uh, the outcome of these experimental results uh, will result in a should result in a fundamental understanding of this reliability concern to help guide manufacturers to solve these issues. For subtopic B, the intent is to increase the ruggedness and address performance degradation and power device failure of silicon carbide MOSFETs um, that are caused by cosmic rays uh, through the identification of failure modes and the conditions that initiate them. Cosmic ray-induced effects, uh, effects uh, exist not only in space and high altitude conditions, but terrestrial ones as well, and uh, these can strongly inf influence the voltage derating necessary for the safe and long-term use of power devices. Proposals will need to establish and compare the influence of um, sorry, will need to establish the influence of cosmic radiation on silicon carbide MOSFETs and silicon car and silicon, excuse me, IGBTs under conditions in regards to cosmic radiation events. Uh, these effects will need to be analyzed to determine the long-term reliability and performance of these technologies. Through these results, designers will be able to make better choices in the use of either traditional silicon or wideband gap semiconductor, uh, specifically in this case, silicon carbide, for different applications. Um, finally, to address uh, another key question that was submitted, uh, the primary focus of both subtopics A and B is uh, experimental in nature. So while including modeling approaches might be necessary and acceptable, the majority of the effort should target experimental approaches as described within the subtopic descriptions. Uh, experimental testing, uh, as described, is particularly important to ensure that the results provide actual and accurate data of the degradation and failure mechanisms of actual tested devices uh, to make the results most beneficial for being able to properly solve these issues by manufacturers. Uh, I think that, that's it, unless there are other questions. I think there were a couple questions there, Marina. Um, let's see, can you give the specificity, or given the specificity of topic 11B, uh, are hardware well? Are hardware deliverables desired or expected in phase one of this topic? And I'll and I'll just point out that uh, we're not looking for any deliverables in any of our topics and subtopics uh, in in regards to what is being sought. Uh, there is a uh, a final report that will be due, or interim report that will be due, uh, following either a phase one or phase two uh, work. But we're not looking for any deliverables. But maybe you can address it from from that perspective, Marina? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think the, my answer would be very much in line with the one that you just provided mm -hmm. and not, uh, you know, we're not looking for uh, any uh, specific hardware deliverables, um, more in, in terms of uh, fundamental understanding and data and results that can, uh, you know, experimental results that can show what's really going on uh, within these devices, within the materials um, that's hampering their performance and their long-term uh, use. 
Very good. Uh, what about uh, do gallium nitride power transistors fall within 11C with the other uh, yes. subtopics? Uh, yeah, so I, I actually um, answered that uh, within the, the description that uh, for subtopic C, uh, gallium nitride-based power okay. transistors would perfectly be acceptable. Um, really looking at the overall description um, and uh, generalizing the first two subtopics, which are fairly specific, um, they're both geared towards device reliability, um, uh, failure and degradation mechanisms, and wide band okay. gap power devices. So gallium nitride would certainly fall within that scope for uh, subtopic C. So I apologize if you answered this as well. I'm trying to pull these questions together here. Um, for topic 11C, will metal oxide wide band gaps such as zinc oxide or other metal oxides be of interest? If figure of merit for power electronics approaches or exceeds that of silicon? Zinc oxide can be perfectly acceptable if uh, these are actually at the device stage and not at just uh, the pure substrate or um, thin film stage. So if there, there are uh, failure mechanisms that have been identified uh, within um, thin film or bulk form metal oxide uh, based devices, uh, power devices, then those also could fall within subtopic C. OK. Manny, uh, did you have something? Uh, no, no. Again, that we are getting a number of uh, questions. I think we can answer a couple, a few more, but uh, okay. some of those may have to wait until uh, may have to contact uh, Marina directly by email. Okay. Let's go ahead and take one more question here from Marina. Um, this is for topic 11B. Is there an ex is experimental measurement desired in phase one? Um, there are. Um, there's a, a description within the topic of um, several of the uh, typical testing methods that could be employed. Um, and so it, it, from there, it is up to the uh, proposer to uh, de develop and propose um, experimentation um, using one of those testing methods. OK. Well, very well, good. Well, thank you very much, Marie. Okay. Yeah, let's go ahead and take another one. I think there are some questions related to one is, are you looking for novel MOSFET constructs? Another, uh, will you be interested in novel concepts that may mitigate concerns through their bulk construction and operation of power devices? That second one relates to A, B, and C. Uh, those, those could potentially fall into subtopic C. However, um, I also want to make note that um, we do also have other funding opportunities and efforts uh, within EERE as well as ARPA-E that address the actual uh, fabrication and development of novel MOSFET designs. And um, th those types of uh, proposals would be better suited uh, within those funding solicitations because those are th that's really the intent of uh, those efforts. Uh, within this effort, we're looking at addressing um, degradation, uh, reliability uh, effects on these existing uh, developed device designs. Okay, thanks. Marina. Thank you. So moving on to topic 12, catalysis. We have, a, we have several uh, subtopic authors here, managers. Uh, let's see, I believe we have, who do we have online here for for topic, uh, subtopic A? Jacob? I see, I should Jacob online okay. here. Uh, yeah, so uh, is this uh, top, the uh, non-PGM catalysis one? Uh, no, well, I, I, Gene Peterson, we have G you, Gene, and uh, Brian that will be addressing all all four to five of these topics here. So Jacob, why don't you go ahead and start, then if you want to jump right in, can you give a, a general overview of what the catalysis topic is? And then you can talk about your subtopic D. 
Oh, okay. Um, yeah, well, I, I'm only covering the subtopic D part. I'm not sure about the rest of the topic, um, so I'll just jump right to that. If that's okay. okay. Um, yeah, so subtopic D is about uh, development of new non-PGM catalysts for the oxygen reduction and oxygen evolution reactions uh, for low temperature fuel cells and for reversible fuel cells, which would include acidic, uh, polymer electrolyte membrane fuel cells, and also alkaline membrane fuel cells. Um, and we're also considering uh, catalysts for the hydrogen oxidation reaction, but that's only for alkaline membrane fuel cells, not interested in acidic fuel cells for hydrogen oxidation. Um, so that's the, that's the gist of the, of the topic. So um, in particular, we're interested in catalysts that demonstrate activity uh, meeting uh, the DOE targets, which are 300 uh, amps per square centimeter at 0.8 volts. And um, it, so for, to meet this target, uh, both high activity, high catalytic activity, and also uh, good mass transport properties are needed, but there's more of an interest in the catalytic activity at this stage. Um, and we did receive a few questions about this subtopic. Um, one of them was a question of uh, whether we would consider uh, greatly reduced PGM catalysts or only completely PGM-free catalysts. For this subtopic, we are only looking at completely PGM-free catalysts. Uh, we already have a portfolio of projects that include uh, PGM catalysts, and we're not looking to add to that at this time. Um, so that's only for, for, I'm only speaking for subtopic 12D. I can't speak for the rest of the topic. Um, I'm not sure about that. Um, we also okay. got a question which is a little bit more general, which is how important is a support letter? Um, I'm not sure if, uh, you know, how specific this is to this subtopic, but I, I guess I would just say that um, uh, we certainly take support letters into consideration, but the, the most important factor is just the technical merit of the proposal. And that's all I have about 12D. Okay, very good. And it looks like that's about all we're going to have here on, on Topic 12 for Catalysis. Uh, you can see who the uh, topic authors are, Gene Peterson for subtopics A, B, C, and F, uh, and Jacob Spendlow for subtopic D. Uh, you just heard from him. And then subtopic E, uh, you can reach uh, Brian Valentine at that email address there. So if you have any questions, please email those uh, managers directly. And no other questions that are coming in specifically for D at the moment that can be answered. So why don't we go ahead and move on to topic 13, uh, which would be uh, membranes and materials for energy efficiency. And I believe we have online here, we might have uh, Will James. Yes. Um, so I'm going to speak on behalf of topics 13B, which is um, um, innovative durable materials for extreme use conditions, and then also speaking on 13D, which is the other category. Um, the uh, technology manager is going to be responsible for that would be Erica Sutherland, but uh, I'm going to speak on her behalf for this uh, um, particular uh, subject. So right now what we're looking for is we've identified a gap um, in the deployment of hydrogen fueling stations where we need to look at uh, polymer materials in extreme environmental conditions. And these extreme environmental conditions um, obviously involve hydrogen, but also high pressures uh, anywhere um, up to 100 megapascals um, or um, close to um, 1,000 bar. Um, and uh, variable uh, temperature range from low temperature in the minus 50 degree C range up until 200 degree C. And um, with these technologies, we're looking to make them lighter weight and cost effective. And so uh, a lot of the um, commercial applications involve the use of polymers and composites. And we're uh, trying to understand um, in more detail how the materials behave in these extreme conditions. Um, and some of the uh, information we're looking for is hydrogen uptake, uh, degradation mechanisms where possible, and then um, extended trying to extend the service life of these. In some cases, for instance, with uh, the use of hoses or seals, we're having to change these out um, only after about a third of their uh, target service life. So improvement in those areas and as well as just gaining a fundamental um, understanding of the materials behavior is what we're looking for. 
Um, other than that, most of the questions that I received um, for thir topic 13B, um, there really uh, wasn't anything um, from the questions standpoint. Uh, it is a kind of a new topic area for us. And anything else related to components or um, hydrogen uh, production or delivery would be submitted under 13D. And so that's, that's all I have. Okay, very good. And I think we're going to have in for, um, we have Ed, Ed Petro, are you there? I am indeed. Uh, this is Ed Petro helping uh, Jim Ed Roderick. Petro. Thanks. Uh, I want to talk just for a moment about the uh, uh, organic light emitting diode portion of the solid state lighting activity at DOE. Uh, for those of you who may be new to this program area, I encourage you to, uh, to go to the Universal Resource uh, Locator uh, listed in uh, Topic 13C for a wealth of background information and reports. The most important element of those reports is our multi-year program plan, which establishes performance guidelines and some cost information uh, for where we need to be with OLEDs in order to make a significant uh, market penetration. Derived from that roadmap are these two highlighted areas for research, which are the subject of this uh, solicitation. The first one is in novel materials, and the second is in novel methods of manufacturing. These are both very broad, and they were intentionally kept broad to encourage a wide range of responses from uh, various people who may be working in other areas of electronic organic materials research that may find applicability in solid state lighting. So um, we have received a few questions. Uh, several of them were very specific about uh, a particular technology. For those that are very specific, I would encourage the authors to uh, correspond directly to uh, Jim Broderick, whose address is shown on the uh, website, or on the uh, view graph and in the uh, uh, FOA, and he'll uh, make sure that you get an appropriate response from uh, a cognizant uh, person. Uh, more generally, however, people were asking if uh, uh, quantitative data would be needed or some sort of proof of principle would be required. And um, that really is not essential. What we're looking for is some technical input that would encourage us to say yes to a specific proposal. So I would encourage any author who's thinking about submitting something that hasn't been proven experimentally to look at um, uh, theoretical prediction to try to bracket the performance expected and put that in the context of the multi-year program plan. That's about all I had. Well, very good, Ed. Uh, we do have a question here, I believe, for 13B. Let me read this. This is for 13B. Uh, can the research look at scale-up of these TBC coatings? We are looking to do the technology transfer and partnering with a university. That might be for you, Will, uh, yes. and that might work. There you go. I would say yes. Uh, it may fall into the other category, and I should add to what uh, was said earlier, that if someone wants to submit something that doesn't seem to be an ideal fit to topic uh, uh, C, 13C, for the two uh, broad descriptions there, they can submit it under the other category, but make sure it's labeled as OLED so it gets routed to the right people. Okay. Very good. Uh, and, okay, I don't believe I see any other questions coming through in regards to uh, the topic managers that we have available for Topic 13. If you do have questions for uh, some of these other topics, here, subtopics here in, in 13, please contact for specifically Subtopic A, Jacob Spendelo. You can reach him. Yeah, and, we, and uh, I didn't talk about that subtopic yet, so um, I was planning to do that still. Okay, uh, let's hear it. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so this subtopic deals with development of new membrane materials for electrochemical devices, including polymer electrolyte membrane fuel cells and alkaline membrane fuel cells, as well as electrolyzers and photoelectrochemical cells. The membrane requirements for these applications have some similarities and also some differences. Um, high conductivity and good mechanical strength are required for all of these applications 
Uh, good tolerance to RH cycling is important for fuel cell membranes, but it's less important for the other devices which tend to operate in a flooded configuration. All components of the membrane are of interest for this subtopic, including the membrane ionomer, um, support materials, and additives um, such as additives to enhance performance or mechanical properties or durability. And uh, we got several questions about this subtopic, which I'll address. Um, one of the questions was, uh, of these three areas, of these three applications, which would be the fuel cells, electrolyzers, and PEC cells, which is DOE most interested in funding? Um, the answer is we're equally interested in all of these selections will be made only on the basis of technical merit. Uh, we were also asked which kind of membrane would be favored, a acidic uh, proton exchange membrane or an alkaline membrane. And again, we're not favoring either type of membrane. Um, applications for either one are welcome, and we'll just make the selection uh, based on the technical merit of the proposals. Um, let's see, we had a question about um, whether uh, applicants are, are uh, eligible to submit proposals if they already have uh, SBIR work funded in this area? That's probably a better question for the SBIR office. Um, but speaking just for the subtopic, as long as uh, there isn't already a project that's doing uh, essentially the same thing. So in other words, as long as this proposal is distinctly different and doesn't overlap with an existing or, or a previous project, um, that's fine with us. Uh, we were asked whether flow batteries uh, would um, be included in this topic, uh, and the answer to that is no. We're only considering applications in the three areas mentioned, so fuel cells, electrolyzers, and PEC cells. Um, there was also a question about, uh, about cost analysis um, for PEC cells in particular, I think. Um, and the, the question was about uh, whether the cost analysis uh, was supposed to cover uh, uh, components in the cell other than the membrane, and the answer is no, it, we're only looking at the membrane. And um, we were asked what sort of benchmark uh, materials should be used for the comparison, um, and any uh, widespread commonly used uh, commercial PFSA would be appropriate uh, to use. Um, and, uh, and that's all that we have for this subtopic. Thank you. Very good. Uh, and there are no other questions coming in for topic 13. So, gentlemen, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to the next subtopic, which is uh, our second to last topic for the day. And this is topic 14, uh, dealing with advanced fossil energy technology research. And I believe we have Doug Archer on the line here. Uh, yes, I will say last but not least, we're now into the fossil energy subtopic. And the uh, topic 14 in general uh, addresses grant applications for the development of innovative cost-effective technologies for improving the efficiency and environmental performance of advanced large-scale industrial and utility fossil energy power generation and natural gas recovery systems. So we have um, basically four uh, subtopics and then another topic. Uh, I'll address the uh, first subtopic, and then I'm going to refer uh, some of the other ones to uh, some of the other uh, topic managers that are online. The first topic covers shale gas uh, conversion and uh, to liquid fuels and chemicals. And specifically here, we're looking for um, proposals to develop novel and advanced concepts for conversion of shale gas to chemicals based on advanced catalysis. So that's the general uh, uh, topic description, uh, and then there's a lot of uh, references referred to in the in the, uh, uh, in the FOI that uh, FOA that that uh, kind of directs you to the, the type of catalysts and type of areas we're looking at. I had a couple of questions specific to 14A. One was, has the technology involved already been explored and the purpose of this research is to develop processes for commercial application, question mark. Uh, yes, it is for to develop uh, processes for commercial application, as, as are all uh, SBIR projects. <laughs> and uh, this uh, technology 
has been explored to some extent, and, and I, again, I refer you to the references as to what uh, what research, uh, some of the research that's ongoing now, to give you some kind of uh, reference there. The uh, next question was in the uh, subtopic shale gas to liquid uh, fuels and, and chemicals conversion. Is there a lot of interest in methane? There is a lot of interest in methane. Is there interest also in upgrading natural gas liquids, uh, ethane, propane, butane, pentane? And uh, here, yes, there is interest also in upgrading uh, natural gas liquids. I think that's mentioned in uh, in some of the uh, in the, either the description or in some of the references. Uh, for instance, uh, if you can convert uh, butane to butanol, that 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 sort of uh, conversion would be also be uh, considered uh, uh, applicable. Uh, for subtopic B, I'm going to refer that to Briggs White. I believe he's online to address that subtopic. Okay, um, this is Briggs White here at NETL, uh, DOE, and um, uh, in subtopic B here, cost-effective interconnect coding process development, we're specifically looking for coatings uh, in the seal area for solid oxide fuel cells. Uh, so these coatings um, would basically protect the uh, stainless steel interconnects uh, from the seal glass. Uh, there's already been a large body of work done to develop several different glasses, and there were a few references posted uh, with the topic language. And the, uh, the seal materials have shown to uh, interact and form uh, degradation byproducts when, uh, when they're interfaced with the steels. Uh, as well as with coatings made of aluminum oxide. And so uh, that research also showed that when interfaced with yttria stabilized zirconia coatings, uh, the seals uh, didn't degrade. Uh, however, um, after doing some investigation uh, with some of our partners within the program, uh, we found that there really wasn't a commercially available process for depositing yttria stabilized zirconia coatings onto stainless steel interconnects to protect those seal areas. So uh, we're looking for some kind of a process that could uh, cost effectively put down that coating and do it in a thin uh, continuous coating and um, that could ultimately be scaled up for mass manufacturing. So with that, I'll um, turn it over to Robin Ames, who's the uh, TTM for subtopic C. Hey, it's Robin Ames, also at NETL, Department of Energy. Uh, my topic, uh, 14C, is discussing the development of enhanced durability high temperature coatings for utility scale gas turbine hot gas path components. So really what we're looking at here would be um, enhancing the durability of the coating systems. This can be either the bond coats or the thermal barrier coatings um, meant to really allow the hot gas path components either the first or second early stages in a utility scale gas turbine to operate at temperatures above 2650 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, within the proposal language, we discuss a, uh, a number of the um, critical uh, um, things that these architectures must possess. I'll list a couple of them, sintering resistance, low thermal conductivity, et cetera. Th they're all listed in the proposal. There's also a couple references um, listed that you can check out, as well as um, some different ways to approach the research, uh, combining the study of both metallic and ceramic components. Um, and things of that nature. I also got some questions um, emailed to me, and I'll touch on some of them. Uh, there were a couple talking about the temperature range. I think I covered that um, in the language, really. The, the goal temperature is uh, 2,650 degrees Fahrenheit and above. Um, there's also a question regarding specific uh, composites and if they could be considered for the improved coatings. And, and while I can't um, comment specifically on with, I don't have too much uh, knowledge on the, the materials that they, uh, they requested. However, really, I'm not, we're not going to draw the line and say if certain materials can or cannot be used. If they can be applied to the goals um, listed in the FOA, I think, I think all would be considered. And then there's another talking about engineered surfaces to promote better TBC bonding. Would that be considered under this subtopic? Um, I feel that that's likely a slightly more applied than this is really looking for. We're looking, or this, we're looking for more of the actual um, coding specifics, and that would likely fall more under the topic 14E or other topic. Um, I don't know if other questions have come in, but uh, that's really all I have. I'll turn it back 
over for topic D. Uh, yes, okay. Um, actually, uh, Joe Wong is the uh, uh, subtopic manager for 14D, but he asked me to uh, field his questions. Uh, his topic is, uh, deals, it's similar to the topic last year, it deals with uh, high efficiency heat transfer technologies for industrial and utility applications. And here we're looking to save on uh, cooling water for, uh, for power plants uh, with systems like dry cooling systems uh, that have more effective heat transfer surfaces and things like that. There's quite a few good references listed uh, in, in this subtopic as well that you can kind of give you guidance. He had some specific questions. Uh, I think there's like four of those, which I can. He gave me the answers to. Uh, one was, what are the operating requirements for the heat transfer devices envisioned in Topic 14D? Uh, he uh, stated that the applicant can perform literature search uh, on uh, the phrase "ultra supercritical." He mentioned a textbook by uh, S. K R O T Z K I uh, B et al. Uh, Power Station Engineering and Economy uh, by McGraw Hill, 1960. And he said other terminology can be searched, such as exit condition or synonym thereof. Uh, he asked uh, the next question was to clarify the evaluation review criteria related to the statement must show at least a 25% cost advantage using annualized levelized cost of electricity per megawatt hour relative to any commercial available dry cooling baseline. Um, this was, uh, he stated that the base of the burden remains on the applicant to represent a persuasive and compelling case to, uh, uh, to one with ordinary uh, state of the art. Uh, he said established bases are preferable and can be cited with diligent research among the prior literatures of Bechtel, Sargent, and Lundy, and other numerous uh, architect engineering firms that have a designed or retrofitted power plant cooling system. Uh, the next question was whether and how <coughs> waste heat scavenging innovation fits into the topic area. Uh, he said that due to the quantity and grade of heat that needs to be dissipated, it would really depend on the capital expense and scalability of the applicant's scavenging innovation. Uh, and he said, historically, scavenging inventions have been limited by the capital expenditure, prohibitive costs, reliability, site-specific dependencies, and other footprint uh, considerations. And he said that uh, you're advised to consider cost and footprint of implementing heat scavenging at a gigawatt scale. Uh, next question was, are technologies with uh, TRL1 of interest in advanced heat transfer and uh, he said that the technology readiness level one technologies would be more uh, appropriately directed to NSF or uh, Office of Science solicitation. Um, then uh, the next topic then would be uh, E, which would be 14 other. And uh, I generally uh, would answer the other topic uh, it, that would fit, uh, should fit uh, proposals that are similar to the subtopics, but not specific, uh, don't specifically fit into the uh, subtopic. And uh, that's what I would, uh, you know, kind of use as guidance for, uh, for uh, uh, application. I had a few specific questions. Uh, um, to sustain economic growth, coal would be playing a role. Can a, a sitter phase one proposal be submitted on coal for utilization? in an innovative manner for steam electric power generation and industrial utility boilers. <clears throat> system will be equally applicable to current and second generation lignocellulosic materials. Um, again, I would say uh, the, the proposals, the other proposals should be similar to the subtopics listed. Uh, th this might be a little uh, out of the uh, scope of the, of the subtopic. Uh, Again, another uh, question that is similar. Uh, I'm considering a, uh, proposing a hybrid piston turbine steam power cycle to improve thermodynamic conversion efficiency. Uh, is that relevant? Again, it should be um, other uh, proposals should be similar to the subtopics listed. 
Uh, otherwise, we, we would get just a, a too large a volume of proposals outside the scope of what we're looking for. Um, <clears throat> that would kind of finish uh, subtopic 14. And uh, I'm not sure you want me to move on to 15. And so we did get one question on 14C. Oh, okay. Uh, and the uh, question was, can the research look at scale up uh, of these TBC coatings? Uh, we are looking to do the technology transfer and partner with the university. Um, this is Robin. Uh, you know, I, I, I'd have to see. I don't. I wouldn't be opposed to that as long as it's a novel uh, coating that would enhance the durability, like we're looking for. I, I don't think if someone's got a great idea out there that's a little bit more further along than than just very basic research, I don't think we'd have a problem with that at all. Okay, thanks. Well. Okay, so let's move on to our uh, last topic of the day, uh, topic 15. It's still in regards to uh, fossil energies, uh, advanced fossil energy separations and analysis research. I believe we'll kick off again with uh, Doug Archer. Uh, yeah, that topic 15 is, is similar to, to 14. I, here we're, uh, we're kind of emphasizing the separations analysis aspects of, uh, of fossil energy technologies. Uh, and here again, we're looking for uh, uh, larger scale applications for uh, industrial and utility fossil power systems, uh, CO2 sequestration, and natural gas recovery systems. Um, the first topic, 15A, uh, is uh, also a repeat from last year, um, and it's looking for uh, subsurface CO2 sequestration monitoring technologies. And that was uh, Bill Fernald had uh, actually received some questions there, and he referred those to me uh, to answer. I think he has about uh, five questions here. Uh, a couple of them I would refer to the SBI or office um, there in general, but the specific ones, uh, I have one on is CO2 surface monitoring of sequestration sites of interest to DOE. Uh, the solicitation asks for subsurface monitoring technologies. Would surface monitoring be responsive? And the answer is yes, if it can help achieve the goal of decreasing the cost and decreasing the uncertainty in, in measurements needed to satisfy regulations for tracking the fate of subsurface CO2 and quantifying emissions from geologic reservoirs. Uh, the next question is uh, size, weight, and power requirements. And uh, uh, Bill states that the, those are not specified in the topic. Uh, the next question, is there a possibility for funding of advances in technology previously funded by SBIR? And uh, his answer is yes. Uh, another question is, uh, what range and resolution of CO2 concentrations would you like to measure for the carbon sequestration? How important is cost? And uh, Bill's answer is a CO2 gas concentration as low as 200 parts per million would be detectable, should be detectable. Monitoring of CO2 above the reservoir should have an accuracy of greater than 99% and a precision of one part per million. Uh, the proposer should be able to define the problem based on literature from projects such as the Zero Emissions Research and Technology Center, or ZERT, project in Montana. And he referred uh, people to the NETL uh, website, uh, uh, www.netl.doe.gov, for references. And uh, he said that the proposer should explain how the analyzer is novel compared to existing systems, and cost is an important consideration. Uh, those are general. The, uh, the other questions are, can be referred to SBI or office. I think they're more uh, program, uh, program uh, related or, or uh, to the SBI or program. Uh, the next topic is, uh, fifth, subtopic is 15B, advanced shell grass recovery. I don't know, is Al Yost online to answer that? Okay, I was hoping Al might be available. Um, but this is a new topic. 
uh, it's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, there, we're looking uh, for technologies and and uh, and and uh, measuring uh, analysis uh, devices to reduce uh, the amount of water needed uh, for hydraulic fracturing uh, when you're. Uh, uh, putting in uh, shale hydraulic uh, fracture wells through shale formations, and uh, I think he uh, he mentions some references there, and he he specifically states the important areas that he's looking for are well well bore formation evaluation techniques, uh, perforation selection strategies, uh, fracturing fluid selection, and fracturing treatment design. And here again, he's trying to increase the efficiency of a recovery uh, on a per well basis and reduce the uh, volume of fresh water required per unit volume of natural gas. So that, uh, if you have any specific questions there, uh, I would refer those again to a a Albert Yost at uh, NETL. Uh, and then the last would be the other topic, and, and then here again, uh, I encourage people that apply to the other topic uh, to uh, generally try to follow the subtopic uh, areas, uh, you know, uh, not not to get too far away from those uh, technology areas. Well, hey, Doug, we have a few more minutes left, only a few left, and we have a few questions. Maybe you can take a shot at some of these, even though uh, Albert Yost isn't online here. Um, maybe you can quickly address some of these. There's one question here on 15 B and C, actually. Uh, would improve down hole power production technologies that can enable better well bore formation evaluation tools be acceptable? Uh, can you repeat that again? Would improved down hole power production technologies that can enable better well bore formation evaluation tools? be acceptable? And if it doesn't make sense to you, maybe we should just have this individual contact uh, uh, Albert Yost directly. Yeah, I would definitely contact Albert. I mean, I, that seems like it would be acceptable to me, uh, but uh, I would confirm that with him. Okay, and this, this is for the other 15C other category uh, subtopic. Uh, would CO2 separation from flue gas by membrane separation be entertained under subtopic 15C? Uh, I, uh, like I say, it should be similar to the existing subtopic, so uh, I don't know, I don't think they mentioned, uh, mentioned that in the subtopics uh, A or B. Okay, well, uh, we, we can tell uh, tell this individual as well if, uh, if he wants to ask a more specific question, he can send that in to, uh, to the topic 15 here, and, and we can look at it more uh, closely yeah. and respond. Um, and just a couple more here as time ticks down. Would solar blind detectors for operation uh, in extreme environments fall within topic 14 or 15? I'm not sure I understand that either. Uh, well, that that would that would probably fall under under 15, uh, but I'm I'm not sure uh, what that technology is. I'd have to look at it to see if it's really uh, responsive. Okay, and let's let's do two more questions here. Um, are you still interested in power plant mercury emissions monitoring? Up, it says this was a topic under this topic last year, but it was not on the list this year. Right, yeah, we didn't rerun that topic. And um, uh, here again, I, uh, yeah, I'd like to stay w within the uh, subtopic, generally uh, within the subtopics listed if possible. Right, and uh, Manny, did you see some any other questions there? Uh, I, I guess there were a couple others, uh, and so again, it, we are running over time, so I'd encourage you, if we didn't get your question today, if it's specifically related to the, uh, the technical areas, to uh, contact the folks that were listed. If it's a general question about the SBR, DOE SBR program, you could send that to uh, our office. 
Um, the, uh, I'll just do one more here for you, Doug. Would fiber optic sensing be of interest for topic B or C? And, or if that's something that Albert should address. Uh, yeah, you'd have to check with Albert. Uh, I, I would. I would think both of those would would be uh, applicable. Okay. So okay, we'll, very good. we'll end the questions uh, here. Um, and uh, so, if you do have any additional questions, mm -hmm. again, send them to our attention or to the uh, the program managers that were listed today. Uh, and uh, again, reminder: there are two additional webinars this week for the uh, the remaining topics uh, in this. Uh, for this first release. Yes, you, you can find uh, the registration information for topics 16 through 28, which is tomorrow. Uh, you can find that and for topics 29 through 40 uh, on Wednesday. Those The registration links are online at the SDOESBIR website. Um, you will be emailed a, a link uh, with the uh, this webinar, this recorded webinar following. Uh, shortly, sometime uh, later today, you should be getting that uh, of this webinar. And uh, I would remind you that uh, for your questions in regards to the funding opportunity announcement, that will be issued, as uh, Manny had mentioned earlier, on uh, August 12th. And there will be a webinar for that, more than likely, uh, on August 16th. And if you have any questions, general questions, as Manny mentioned, you may also just call us at 301 903 5707, we can answer many of your, your SBIR program-related questions that way. Uh, and if it is in regards to the actual topics, is, uh, go ahead and contact those uh, managers directly via their email address uh, in the topics document, which is also on our website and uh, also included in the uh, webinar here. Uh, Manny, would you like to say any closing words here before we hang up and wrap up here? Right. Yeah, again, thanks for everyone's interest. I know we did have uh, Looks like almost a couple hundred people dial in today, so we appreciate uh, uh, you participating. And if you have any other suggestions uh, uh, to make these uh, webinars more useful uh, to you, please let us know. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and this concludes our webinar.